leaving housing completely. I know. Hi. Just to, because we need to start immediately because we're running a little late. So Teresa Bryce, uh, Pamela Hawk, Scott Tees, and Angeline Chandler, if they would come up here and sit in the front row. So we're doing the, uh, the second session of the Loeb University. My name is Kisli Balderson. I'm, uh, I'm a Loeb Fellow from last year. I'm also the only Loeb Fellow from Iceland. Uh, and on the list where you can see what we do, it's, uh, there are lots of architects and planners and designers and developers, and I'm the only one that's titled talk show host which is accurate, but embarrassing. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I have hosted talk shows in Iceland, uh, but I've never hosted Pecha Kucha style talks, so bear with me if I refuse to leave the spotlight and only focus on myself and not be interested in what the speakers have to say. Uh, uh, no, but uh, the Pecha Kucha, I don't know if you, if you speak Japanese, but Pecha Kucha actually, uh, and in Japanese means uh, densify, put in bike lane, stitch the car, or die. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's fitting that we do that here. So Julie Camboli hosted this yesterday, so you know how this works. I think I will have this thing here, and I will put the show on, and you won't have any control over, what your, over your slides. And uh, you have five minutes each. And let's see, so I don't want to jump. If I do this, will this go? Uh, I'm right behind you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but so now I'm introducing you, and before I before I hit the button, uh, I'm gonna I'm just going to give you the floor, and you can prepare. And when I say go, you go. Okay. So <laughs> Teresa Bryce. <laughs> Thank you. I have only one correction. My name is Teresa. And don't, don't feel alone, I'm the only lobe from Phoenix. So there are some of us in the um, wastelands, you might say, uh, that, are, that are working on our own. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this story. Go ahead. Go. Go. <laughs> so this is the image that Phoenix has promoted for decades. Cowboys, cactus, blue skies, open spaces. But this image has not served Phoenix well because it allows people to dismiss Phoenix as simply a place to vacation or to retire. But I'm going to tell you what it's really like to live and work in the nation's sixth largest city. Arizona's had a tough time lately. These dust storms you see come from subdivisions that were abandoned in the desert. We lost 150,000 construction jobs during the recession. We had the third highest foreclosure rate in the country and nasty fights over immigration. So in the middle of all this, this guy from New York University writes a book called Bird on Fire. And he calls Phoenix the world's least sustainable city. Not exactly an image makeover, but it's better than one I heard. A Arizona puts the AZ in crazy. <laughs> so our Metro Phoenix, our Metro Phoenix line, you're cutting into my time. The Metro Phoenix line opened in 2009, and I credit my Loeb year for giving me the language to articulate a new vision for the future of Phoenix. As executive director of LISC Phoenix, I created this slogan to capture that vision. And together with a $20 million investment fund, we decided to see what we could do in the Valley of the Sun. Our first priority, of course, was affordable housing along the light rail. Our, mu our market study indicated that we needed to build 110,000 units of affordable housing only along the light rail corridor. And it's made especially challenging because we don't have the tools that some of you might use. Tax increment financing is literally unconstitutional in Arizona, and inclusionary zoning is also illegal. Of course, we face a lot of resistance to higher density and mixed-use development. People think it's an Obama plan to get people out of the suburbs. But, Despite these challenges, um, we were it managed to support the development of over 2,000 units of affordable housing, all within a quarter to a half mile of the light rail station. Vacant lots occupy 43% of the total land in Phoenix, and a lot of that land is along the light rail corridor. And that might seem strange to those of you who come from cities that are built out, but with 
over 500 square feet in the city of Phoenix, excuse me, 500 square miles in the city of Phoenix, uh, developers found it easier to jump over vacant lots and get to the green fields where it's easier to develop. Here you see a 15 acre vacant parcel right next to a light rail station in Midtown. It's turned into a community garden which allows immigrant refugees to farm their traditional cop crops and take them to the public market on the light rail. We also knew it was important to use transit to connect to uh, affordable housing to jobs. So we focused on helping small businesses relocate to the light rail corridor, sometimes reusing vacant commercial space, and sometimes uh, using, uh, convincing large employers like State Farm to build their new regional hub within half a mile of the light rail as you saw, bringing over 8,000 jobs. Access to affordable health care is another equity issue. In Phoenix, there's no hospital south of the Salt River bed, and in Mesa, there's no hospital north of Main Street. We were proud to support the first federally qualified health center, which opened at the light rail station in Mesa in 2012, and next year, a wellness center that will treat Native Americans with behavioral health issues using traditional healing methods, as well as more uh, modern methods, as well as providing housing on site. Zoning changes along the light rail corridor allowed us to develop mixed-use projects. In both of these cases, we were able to combine supportive services with housing. Native American Connections used a New Market Tax Credits grant to purchase a building and combine services with a Phoenix Indian Center. And a few years later, as you can see in the lower picture, Native American Connections built affordable housing. The second one is a former homeless shelter that was rebuilt as a permanent supportive tax credit development and combined supportive services services for their clients, but it's also accessible to the larger community through the light rail. Of course, this initiative was not all just sticks and bricks. It involved a lot of policy work and community engagement to make the transition from suburban to urban style development. The first piece is a portable uh, work book, um, which can go to community meetings, and the second one is a TOD guidebook, which provides a checklist and an easy reference guide for neighborhoods to evaluate projects. Our future is on the line is about using transit as a platform for community and economic development. It's simple. If we didn't have light rail, we wouldn't have equitable TOD. A recent article said it this way, against all odds, Phoenix has a light rail line and it's expanding. Ridership has exceeded expectations. And that acronym up there, it was coined by a, a journalist from Phoenix and he used it when the light rail first opened. It stands for we built it, you bastards. <laughs> and we're building more. Yeah. Good morning. Education is a key to equity, especially for women. But odds are that these girls in Tanzania will finish, well, only one of these girls in Tanzania will finish high school. There are many reasons, but one is simply lack of schools. Girls may walk or bicycle for hours to get to schools or have to live with relatives or strangers, in all cases putting them at risk for exploitation and violence. In 2013, as volunteers, we planned a public boarding school for girls 50 kilometers south of Mwanza, Tanzania's second largest city. It was something we dreamed about for years. Africa School House partners with local governments to renovate and build schools in rural Tanzania, like this 60-room primary school in, tu in Tulia. With minimal bureaucracy, a strong track record, and a passionate founder who just happens to live across town from us in Portland, Maine, this NGO was a great fit for us. We spent three months living in the countryside next to the Natulia School. Without electricity or running water, we gained a great perspective on everyday life there. 100 degree heat, dusty fields, and torrential downpours that flooded our house. We'd shopped in local village markets and planned meals without refrigeration. Traveling 200 kilometers along Lake Victoria, we documented facilities for learning and living at six private and public girls' boarding schools. We listened more than we talked, something that's hard for lobes but easier when you don't speak Swahili. <laughs> the girls were our experts and inspiration. They were quick to answer when we asked what they wanted to be, engineers, doctors, aerospace engineers, or accountants. We soon realized that with limited resources, 
materials, tools, electrical power, and a relatively high unemployment rate, that labor-intensive construction was actually a worthy objective, while providing the families with the means to pay the required school fees. Our work at times was also labor-intensive. Most effective communication tool that we used was this um, site model, uh, constructing, uh, modeling 15, uh, 50 buildings out of balsa wood that we had brought from the states. In these real rural settings, uh, providing uh, on-campus housing for the teachers was part of the compensation package. It had also assured that the teachers were staying near the classrooms and would be in the classrooms. For these residents, we addressed the intense solar gain using uh, a vented double roof, uh, which was inspired by an old uh, 1968 Land Rover that we used to own. A classroom uh, remodeling project in a nearby village gave us the opportunity to test some of our proposed construction techniques. Working with the crew, we built full-scale mock-ups that helped us uh, communicate and translate our construction uh, drawings. By varying the heights of perpendicular spacer trusses, we were able to both address the uh, solar gain within the classrooms as well as creating a form which was reminiscent of the uh, thatch roof structures that dot the landscape. Small changes like the roof can make a big difference. Our design for science labs and classrooms starting construction next month uses techniques familiar, familiar to Africa schoolhouse crews, site burn brick, wood trusses, metal roofs. The typical flimsy and fragile glass jealousy windows will be replaced with a new louver system that increases light and ventilation while protecting from rain and vandalism. By the end of our stay, we partnered with a local district to map out a campus for a secure, supportive environment for 400 girls in six grade levels. An academic quad and dorm clusters will create a strong sense of community and identity. Water harvesting, composting latrines, and solar-powered lighting will teach girls sustainable solutions for their home villages. Classrooms, dorms, and teacher houses will be built over many phases as funding arrives. The multi-purpose dining hall, shown in its first third, will be visible from the main road between Mwanza and Dar es Salaam. It's an inverted form, a fish or a boat, uh, depending on your perspective. We like to think about it as a boat that symbolizes the girl's safe journey from through wisdom to adulthood and realizing their dreams. Thank you. I am leading the capital portion of the new Community Parks Initiative, also known as CPI, at New York City Parks. This is a mayoral park equity program that will reconstruct parks in New York City's densely populated and growing neighborhoods with higher than average concentrations of poverty. The first phase of the initiative, funded for $130 million, will focus on 35 neighborhood parks with the greatest need. Our approach first defined and identified under-resourced parks. We analyzed 20 years of data to identify parks that had received less than $250,000 of investment. We performed detailed on-the-ground surveys and sought to select parks that were accessible to nearby communities that offered diverse recreational opportunities. These 35 parks are just the first of 134 reconstructions that are funded over the next five years. The 35 sites average one acre in size and are typically big asphalt fields with few amenities and surrounded by fences. We will completely reconstruct these parks. The funding allocated per site averages over $3 million. Beyond providing new programmatic amenities, we are partnering with the city's Department of Environmental Protection to implement green infrastructure in each of these parks in the form of rain gardens, permeable pavers, synthetic turf, and below grade storm chambers. We are also piloting the capture of street storm water in these green infrastructure features, which is also involving a collaboration with the city's Department of Transportation. 
and we are implementing a new program called Parks Without Borders in which the park reconstruction will extend to the street. Sidewalks will be reconstructed, perimeter fences will be lowered or eliminated, and park entrances will be made more inviting. Another way in which we are addressing park equity is through an inclusive process. We tried some new things to enhance community outreach and feedback. We developed a new type of scoping procedure that enlarged the community group that we typically gather for, for input on what we should do at each park. For all 35 of the phase one parks, we had over 1,100 people attend scoping sessions. And we also used online input forms and had more than 250 online surveys submitted. Um, we held the scope meetings in the evening at a school or community center near the park. We provide dinner for families so that families could come. We provided translation so that everyone was heard. And we asked the community what their priorities were for the park reconstruction, focusing on four questions. Who uses the park most? Uh, do you want active or passive features? What matters to you most in the reconstruction? And what would you like to be able to do in the park that you can't do now? These parks fell into this state of disrepair because there were no community groups lobbying for their improvement. We, so we had to reach deep uh, to engage the neighborhood. We invited the schools and the children that use these parks, the local athletic leagues, sen senior centers, business associations, community gardeners, any interested party. In the community scope meetings, we showed images of what other of other parks throughout the city to demonstrate what these park transformations could like look like. Sorry, Some examples included spray showers, adult fitness equipment, community gathering areas, play equipment for kids of all ages and abilities, and active recreation such as handball and basketball. Following the scope meetings, we analyzed the community's priorities in a series of pie charts for each site. In addition to a demand for active recreation for people of all ages, we saw that there was a great desire for passive recreation amenities, such as green space, areas to garden, community gathering, as well as a wish for very basic amenities, such as drinking fountains, benches, tables, shade, security, and lighting. After understanding these priorities, the design teams worked to quickly develop concept plans that presented a general layout of the new park. And within 45 days of the scope meeting, we took each concept plan to the community board to say, this is what we heard you say you wanted, and this is the plan we're moving forward with. Our focus was to show the community and to get their input on the programmatic elements that would be provided and where, and less on what they would look like. Following that, we prepared more detailed schematic designs, which we again took to the community boards for their review and comment. With this additional community engagement in the park design, you might ask how that impacted our already expedited timeline of 12 months for design, nine months for procurement, and 12 to 18 months for construction. We found, though, that the community engagement actually sped up a normally lengthy design review process. The hard data on community priorities from the scope meetings enabled us to unequivocally justify decisions made and to ensure that what was designed and approved was what the community really asked for. Thank you. This was great. Three fantastic talks here. Uh, before we break, uh, uh, we are running a little bit behind schedule, but not too much. Did you want to say something? Um, are Can you I introducing in the students? Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So. What I was going to do is to introduce two students uh, that worked on the uh, Black and Design Conference two weeks ago. Uh, that was a huge success, and we wanted to give them just two minutes before we break, and then we have to be back here before 11.15. So let's give a warm welcome to Asura Cox and Mekan, Mekan Eccles. Hi everyone, uh, it's great to be here. My name is Azura Cox. I'm a third year landscape architecture student here at the GSD and the vice president of the um, GSD African American Student Union. And hi, my name is Megan Eccles. I'm a second year urban planning student here at the GSD, a committee member of the African American Student Union and also a committee member of the Black and Design Conference. 
So very quickly, the GSD African American Student Union, or ASU, is dedicated to supporting the advancements of African Americans in the areas of architecture, design, real estate, urban design, urban planning, and landscape architecture. Um, we, we think that providing the sort of the opportunity to build strong relationships while at the GSD and in the field, ASU members um, and the school at large are empowered with the resources to not only transform our communities so physically but socially as well. Um, the ASU has, was founded in 2012 um, and the group currently works closely with admissions and the dean's office um, to increase the numbers of black students, jurors, and faculty at the GSD in addition to sort of having our own programming. So last year in response to events in Ferguson, Baltimore, across the nation, the ASU initiated several long-term initiatives. Um, we're currently pursuing the Map the Gap initiative, um, which is meant to sort of visualize institutionalized racism. And just a couple of weeks ago, on October 9th and 10th, we held Harvard's first annual Black and Design Conference. So Megan and I are gonna tell you a bit more about the conference. The Black and Design Conference, organized by the ASU at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, seeks to simultaneously recognize the contributions of African descendants to the design field and to broaden our definition of what it means to be a designer. Uh, we believe that initial steps towards addressing social injustice through design and to reclaim the histories of underrepresented groups in design pedagogy and to implicate designers as having a role in repairing our broken built environment. Dedicated to the pursuit of just and equitable spaces across all scales, the co this conference will broach conversations in increasing orders of magnitude, the building, the neighborhood, the city, the region, and the globe. We hope that this conference will serve it to ingrain compassion for human beings into the ethos of design more broadly, as well as to serve as a call to action for the GSD to instill within each and every person who passes through its doors the responsibility to build just and equitable spaces at every scale. Um, yeah, sorry, you know, sorry for reading this out because we know you can read, but we felt it was actually important to sort of state that here again. Um, so as Megan said, we organized the conference, um, sort of, we had uh, panels throughout the day, and we wanted to talk about how we as designers can sort of act on multiple scales from the building to the region. And for all, so you can see here um, the different uh, neighborhood, uh, different scalar panels, and then we also had a keynote with Phil Freeland and Daryl Crooks of The Atlantic, and a lunch panel about food and justice. And you'll see many um, Loeb Fellows on our, represented on our panels, which um, is no accident. Um, and we sort of asked an overarching question, which was, um, you know, coming from such diverse practices, how do you engage people and structures at the scale of, you know, blank, the building and neighborhood? And also, how does your practice interact at this scale with materiality, culture, and social consequences, um, especially as they relate to black communities? Um, so we just have a few pictures also from the different panels. Yeah, so the conference was received very well. We sold over because so many people wanted to be in attendance. And overall, we had 384 attendees. Um, and you know, Piper sits about 400 people, so that's really good. 38% uh, were current GSD students or staff, and about 28% were professionals, 20% came from other universities, and 4% were high school students, and we had people from all over the nation, California, Texas, um, Virginia, Florida, so from all reaches of our country, which was great. Yeah, and you can, I mean, it was, you know, it wasn't a traditional conference in many ways. <laughs> um, this was the first session we started out with um, an amazing sort of uh, led yoga breathing <laughs> exercise. With, with Stevie Wonder music, With of Stevie course. Wonder music yeah. um, that got everyone going. But the amazing thing is that the Piper was, this was the most empty that Piper got throughout the day, right at the beginning, which is generally the opposite happens usually, you know, to empty us out. Yeah, and people, there was a lot of engagement, um, a lot of participation. The auditorium stayed full, and it was just an amazing audience to have here. And we had um, interludes, like this is Kumba, the Kumba singers of Harvard College who are sort of dedicated to the art of black creativity and um, saying a few numbers. And you know, the, the panel contents, the content was incredible. And so these are just a few of the quotes um, that were highlighted on social media. Yeah, and you can find those at hashtag black and design. Black and design and also uh, design matters, I black think. Black design matters. Black design matters. Um, so yeah, this is just a, a, a brief recap of the social media presence. You can see we had a lot. Um, we really had a lot of um, activity. We generated a lot of activity online. Um, 
Yeah, and once again, the, the conference was really well received. Um, we got like not only great tweets about it, but great emails and great people coming up to us just expressing how much like love that they felt in the building. So it was yeah. great. Um, so since we're all here, you know, and this and obviously the conversation continues, and we've gotten great support from Dean Mostafavi's office and the school at large, and we think this is just the beginning. So we're kind of thinking about how to build on this momentum. So if you have any ideas, um, you can email us at blackanddesign at gsc.harvard.edu. And since we're all here celebrating 45 years of the Phenomenal Loeb Fellowship Program, we wanted to take this opportunity to thank a few Loeb's, more than a few Loeb's actually, who provided generous support and advice in uh, planning this conference. Um, so just many, some of many, um, Jean Lauer, Mark Norman, Chi Perlman, Theaster Gates, LaShawn Hoffman, Setu Jones, Janelle Chan, Neha Bhatt, and then last but not least, Mark Mulligan and Sally Young. In the last few words, we just wanted to thank the Loeb Fellowship because the Loeb Fellowship has been a very important friend and ally for the GSDA issue um, throughout the past few years. And we just look forward to continuing and strengthening our relationship as we build on the success of the conference and other endeavors that we've had over the past three years. Thank you. Thank you.